use um, neural networks to uh, help identify uh, diabetic retinopathy in images of the backs of people's eyes um, to help doctors better diagnose and help lots and lots of people in places where they can't reach them. So they have volunteers go out and take these pictures and then instead of a doctor having to look through a thousand images a day, they have a neural network do it. So, just some basics about, first of all, what even is a neural network. Uh, a neural network, you take any kind of input, it can be pixels in an image, or it can be time series information, or uh, any kind of tabular data, or any kind of information, and you process it through a series of nodes. You give it some original weight. If you're making one from scratch, and not using transfer learning, you would have random weights given to all these possible, all saying like, okay, a, a red value of this much in this pixel, how much does that matter, and whether or not this is a cat, right? Let's guess that it weighs this much, or it's, it's really, really important, or, it, or it's important, man, not so much, right? Then every time you make a guess, in the next layer, these, these weights from all the previous layer are added up, and then there's a there's a nonlinear activation applied to it to give it more of a push from either like either this is gonna really fire or not fire, right? And then that activation is passed on to the next layer, and so on. Until in the end, you're guessing whether or not it's a cat, or you're guessing did they have a stroke, or you're trying to figure out is it diabetic retinopathy, like what is it? Uh, and the magic of this really comes in the back propagation. Um, the very dust behind neural networks really is this. It was, uh, gradient descent is one of many back propagation algorithms current, you know, that can be used. But this was invented or discovered in like the 50s, but there was not enough computational power to make use of this. Uh, but now it's everywhere, and the more we use it, the more it'll be used. Uh, but basically it takes whatever you push through your network, at the end, you're gonna compare what you were expecting to get with what you actually got. And the difference, there's some measurement in, in, in uh, numeric measurements of how far you were off that. And that, you're gonna use that, I'm not gonna explain this too much, but there's, you're gonna use that to change these weights now. Like, oh, we thought this pixel really mattered. It doesn't matter quite so much. Let's push those values for that pixel down just a bit. Does that make sense? So neural networks can have uh, many layers. Uh, there's always an input layer of whatever pixels or whatever you're putting in, and any number of hidden layers, any number of nodes in those hidden layers, and then some output layer. If you're doing something where it's just binary, like is it a cat or not, or a hot dog, not hot dog, right? You can have one, but if you're trying to guess, you, you know, they might have a thousand classes of, you know, cats and dogs and toasters and toothbrushes and all kinds of things, right, that you want to know about, you'll have a whole line of things in the end. What's different about a convolutional neural network, or just any kind of neural network, is that instead of every layer, like here, every layer, every node and every layer being attached and connected have some weight on every other layer. Convolutional neural networks have some systematic way of taking sections and summary statistics for sections at a time and applying that to the next layer. So not every, not, not every node or pixel from the original image is actually applying to this part of this neural network. Of this layer. That far. So an image in a convolutional neural network is like a bunch of pixels, and if it's a color image, if it's a color image, you've got three channels: red, green, blue, or whatever. If you're using a different form, you might have four channels. But you have each each pixel value. This is one. This is the corner pixel, right? It's got a value of this for four, for blue, this for green, this for red, and uh, when you pass it into a neural network, you take all three of those channels and you stack them on top of each other to one big long vector that is then going to be applied to the network. And when you put a bunch of vectors together, you get a matrix of all these images 
you can pass through your neural network. This is really, right here is the heart of what makes a convolution, right? What makes a convolutional neural network. Essentially, you can think of it like shining a flashlight on the image and looking at sections at a time to make some sort of a summary of what you see in this section. So for example here, in this section, you can see the 105 here, multiplied by zero, plus 102 multiplied by negative one, plus 100 multiplied by zero, this by neg negative one, this one times five, etc. These These values in here are applying to this section and that summary statistic is being placed onto the output in the next layer. Okay? And then this is going to move and do the same thing right here and right here and right here. Da, 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 da. On, on, on. Yeah. Is, is it the same kernel matrix that just kind of moves along? Yes. 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 But you can have yes with the caveat. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'll explain it in a minute. Okay. We'll get back to that question. Uh, that's a great question, actually. Uh, so let's say we have an image that looks like this. It's just a real boring, we've got half the picture is white, half the picture is black, and we're trying to figure out where in this image is the line between the white and dark edges. So for an example of the type of kernel that could do this work for us, let's say we have values, positive one on this side, negative one on this side, and zero in the middle. Okay? And we take this kernel and we're going you can see when it's here in the green section that it's gonna, this side is gonna nullify this side and these are zero, so you get a zero, right? But when you're here down in the red section, these all have values, right? That you got 30 here, zeros here, and zeros here. Now you've got a value of 30. So in a very crude way, you found the edge essentially here. You found the vertical edge by passing the kernel over your image to find it. That's just one type of kernel that can exist. If you were looking for horizontal edges, for example, you might have something like this. If you were looking for curves, maybe you'd have some different numbers in these corners and over here, or dots, or who knows what you have, right? You might have all kinds of crazy things. The crazy thing is that the magic of back propagation can work to adjust these as well, right? So you can start your, your neural network with random numbers in here. And as your network learns, it'll adjust these numbers as well as the weights of each of the values of how much, okay, we have this kernel, let's adjust this by a little bit, but then let's not count it by much, right? It's going to do all this by back propagating by itself. So you don't even know what features it might be learning for itself under the hood. It's just, <laughs> I mean, it's magic. I mean, really magic. I can't believe we get to play with this. <laughs> so you can imagine if you start with it, you have a kernel processing summary statistics over these. Do, 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 do. When you each step, you're going to get smaller and smaller and smaller. So if you don't want it to get smaller, you're going to have to add padding around the edges, zeros, right? So now if you take, say, a kernel right here, you're going to have zero, zero, zero. Oh, but that 123 counts for something, right? And then you move it around. Another factor you want to pay attention to. So if you, if you are coding with this and you want to write a neural network of your own, right? And you want it to, to keep the input image the same size as your output matrix, you want to say padding the same. And a lot of, most libraries will have, the, have this as an option where it'll just figure out how much how many zeros do you need around the edges? Um, the filter can be any size, right? It doesn't have to be three by three, it can be any, any size. Plus the stride, which is the number of pixels you move, right? If we're at stride one, we're gonna go here, then here, right? But if we're at stride, stride two, we're gonna go here, and we're gonna skip one, we're gonna start here, and then we're gonna skip one, right? So we're gonna have different strides and different padding. Another type of layer is a mass pooling layer. This is very common in neural networks, where you take the biggest number in a section, and that's the only one that makes it through. So you want to know if there was a vertical edge somewhere over here. Well, maybe there was a vertical edge, that's a pretty big number, somewhere in this corner. 
right? So it'll kind of give you this summary statistics as you go through. You might use average pooling or other kinds of pooling layers, but max pooling is probably the most common. So, with a convolutional neural network, again, we're passing that light, that flashlight over, giving ourselves information about sections at a time, summary statistics, then summarizing our summary statistics with max pooling layers. So you might have, in one layer, you might have, say, like, uh, some filter that uses 3x3 three three to go over this, and then you have three channels, one for each red, green, blue, and you're going to paddle that up with another filter that's will be for some other feature. We have a horizontal edge and a vertical edge, and we've got a swirly dot, and we've got a, you know, whatever we're looking for in this, all in one layer. Then it's going to be applied, you, you apply that nonlinear activation and push that onto the next layer. So you might have, commonly you might have, say, a bunch of filters that then get summarized, then a bunch more filters that are now applying their weights to what you output from the previous layer, right? And then you summarize that. And then you have maybe 10 more, who knows? And then at the very, very end, you take every bit of information from this and you flatten it out again into one big vector and apply everything from that into the output. You can make some actual convolutional layers, pooling layers, fully connected layers, and other types of layers I won't get into, but. So this is a cool um, visualization I got from Andrew Ng's online um, class in Coursera. It's so awesome, I fully recommend this class. Um, what he did was he took, uh, he took a, an, this layer, for example, he took the kernel is on this layer, and he found images that maximally activated those kernels. They're just in a 9 by 9 square because there's, that's easy to look at. But he's showing, for example, so this isn't, this isn't like from one picture. This is like the summaries of many pictures, right? So for example, on the first layer, you might have kernels that are looking for something like this, like vertical layer, vertical stripes green squares or like, you know, some faded areas, right? But then this information is being passed on to the next layer, which is then also a different kernel set is going to look at it. And it might find things like, okay, we know about vertical lines, now we look for lots of vertical lines together. Or we know about dots, but now we're looking for spirals. The next layer, gets, I mean, might even get this complicated that you're already on to like spotting people just by the magic of randomly initiating these things and then having it teach itself. It's amazing. So these filters might look for anything, these, these images maximally uh, activated this particular kernel, you know, it's looking for like beehive stuff. Then you get even more complicated, you've got a dog spotter, <laughs> you've got a bird leg, Looker upper, I don't know. <laughs> Some weird stuff in there. And till the end, when you're, say, layer five, we're looking at uh, flowers. Here's a different kind of dog. Bird's eyes, dog legs. It's bizarre. <laughs> so in transfer learning, all of that work. All of that back propagating that needed to happen and all that training of all those images that needed to happen to develop those filters to be able to spot chicken legs, you know? Uh, that took a lot of work to make a chicken leg spotter, right? And someone had to do that with a lot of images. Uh, and you can do it yourself if you want to. But transfer learning is really cool because someone, lots of people have offered their computing time and the images that are available on the internet to, uh, to train this for you and you can just use it for whatever project you're doing. So what you'll do is take out, okay, you've got all these weights and the structure that's been defined by this training, but you put your own images through and you cut off the end where whatever they were doing to, to guess what the image was you cut that off and you apply a few layers of your own to make sense of whatever you've gotten out of this network. And then you can try chicken leg spotters on your eyeball data. You know? 
maybe there's like swirly things in there and it looks a lot like the beehive stuff or something, right? Those, those filters might work. So ImageNet is 1.4 million images, open source. You can see it's like cats and dogs and salt shakers and whatever else correctly labeled in over a thousand categories. And then there's some examples. People built some kinds of architecture. This is a real, this is like an early one, Lynette Phi. Or ResNet, which is this amazing thing, by trying out different options. They try, like, let's try this, but if that doesn't work, we'll send a bypass. We'll send you the information from the previous layer, so you can just use that instead if none of this was useful. And applying that over and over again. Or Inception Network. You don't know what should go next. Should it be a max pooling layer? Should it be this kind of filter, that kind of filter? What size? I don't know. Let's just try it all and put it all in one big layer. And that's an inception model, right? So if you have the inception works like this, you've got like all these things piled into one concatenated layer, and then you have these inception modules piled on top of each other. This is inception version one. Or my personal favorite, inception resonant which is, okay, let's try everything, like an inception module. But if that doesn't work, let's add a bypass route, right? Let's try everything, but if that doesn't work, let's add a bypass route. And let's do that 10 times like this, and then we'll add another one. And then we'll do 20 times like this, and then we'll do 10 more like this. And just all that work, all done, all ready, all trained. So in Keras, if you want to use this in Keras, this is the easy part, in Keras, they offer these models. MobileNet is an option. Uh, it's a little bit smaller transfer learning model that you can use that if you're, if you're building like a robot and you want it to be able to see, then you can use MobileNet. Um, but all these other things are available free with open weight, uh, with a weights already trained on this, this uh, image net. And this is the code. So simple. Just a few libraries. I mean, besides whatever you need to do for your own KRS model, you're, you're writing that, I won't get into that. But to add a mobile net base, you just say weights equals image net. KRS already has, image net is the only one they have, but they have all the weights saved from training this model on image net. Um, you want to include, you want to have this part include top false. Otherwise, you're getting that output layer, the final part of their model. Um, and then your input shape is whatever your model is, whatever your size image is, you're going to have 256 by 256 by 3 channels is what I was using for this. And then you just add layers. You make your model, right? And then you add the mobile net base, because you already imported it with the library. Add whatever other layers you want to put at the end and your output layer. Ta-da! <laughs> and an optional thing, if you don't want to end up using a lot of uh, computational power, uh, you don't want all those filters for chicken legs to be remade uh, or adjusted or messed with at all, you can freeze that whole section and just have it train your last few layers at the end. Um, so you want to just use this dot trainable if it's false. That's it. <laughs> Question? Yeah. Did you were you able to make a model for the diagram? Yeah, yeah, and then transfer learning really helps. Yeah. Even just actually I just used the mobile net just to make sure we could get this to work with transfer learning. And even just mobile net really improved. So yeah. So I know that in meteorology, like machine learning is because some people complain that like the science gets forgotten. Like, what's the consensus in the medical community? Well, I think I, I would I don't know because I'm not really in the medical community, but I do know that a lot of these like image recognition, medical imaging things are meant to flag images that then the doctor would need to look at. I don't think it's meant to replace the doctor. I hope, <laughs> really. But you know, if the doctor's looking at you know, let's say they've got like a thousand images a day, they're much more likely to miss 
that one has a problem than if they just get eight images and they've got to you know, verify that, yeah, it's correct. I, I think it's actually really powerful, especially with imaging. Because um, some of these things are really hard to see, too. And even, I mean, even in this problem space, we find that a lot of the doc, like, the, um, if they, they give the same image to multiple doctors, they have a wide range of reactions. So, you know, it's a, it's a tough problem to solve, yeah. Yeah, what's the success rate for the um, identifying the eye problem between humans and the best neural network? Uh, that's a good question. Um, but the best neural network right now, there's like 85% accuracy of five, of five classes. Um, but the, the, I don't know what the individual doctor is, thing is. What they found is that if they had, what, like, what was it, four doctors, different doctors looking at the same um, image that they could get consensus among like most of the time, but uh, with one doctor, the, the um, neural network is beating them. Yeah, yeah. Two questions. First, what level of accuracy were able to get with this transfer learning network? Yeah. And the second question is, which, based on that value, what was the benchmark that you guys were using to compare this transfer learning network against to make sure that you actually were, let's say, getting uh, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, because it's a chemical competition, we're not quite so worried about the computational time because we're not going to deploy this to be like used. Um, you have a maximum time of nine hours on their on their um, kernel, so that's 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 not as much of a concern. Um, but with uh, just 20 epochs, we sort of leveled out. It was over overfitting quite a bit on its own model at what, like 96% accuracy on its own training data, but uh, the validation was around 80%. And then without transfer learning, I mean our model was much, much smaller obviously, right? I don't know how a similarly length, something of a similar size would compare from scratch, you know? MobileNet has what, like 100 and something layers. No, 86 layers. Um, that's 86 hidden layers in, in there. Uh, our model had 10 or so, and we were getting like 74, 75, and then with the transfer learning up to 80%-ish, 79, 80. That's on validation. Uh, and did you notice any were increases in false positives and false negatives for the model itself? Uh, it's, it's, uh, you know, I'm not sure that the, this is something we need to look into, what is their accuracy me metric? Um, they, uh, I'm not sure how many of were false positives, false negatives. What we have is a five class output, so, it, um, it's possible that some outputs that were, that you know, should have been a three are just a, a four or something like that. Um, it's, it's actually likely that it's, it could be close when it's not, you know, we don't know. Yeah, it's only, it's only discrete possibilities, you know, only five classes. Um, we're, we're thinking about trying to make a, um, a linear output to, to get an idea of how close we are, you know, how many fours did we guess for threes, and how many twos did we guess for ones, this kind of thing. Um, but I don't know about false positive, so false, false negative, or, yeah. Yeah. So, um, that was pretty interesting how you broke out color to red, green, and blue, and that's they didn't match. I was kind of wondering how that works. Um, does the same work for sound? I'm working on a use case to identify a sound. You basically do the same thing. Yeah, um, I haven't done sound, but I mean, I, I know people try to use a Fourier transform on sound to turn like different cuts, um, frequencies to isolate what frequencies are are in any moment of sound. Um, so yeah. you could potentially have those on different channels, like you did in an image. Maybe I don't know. That's an interesting question. It's it's to identify like a chainsaw noise. Yeah. Then, yeah. Yeah, I'm just wondering if you can kind of follow the same theories. 